Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your astrologer and your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. I'm truly so excited to share with you today Soul Unison. Now, Soul is somebody that I just recently started to get to know because she and I both are going to be at astrologyrisingcostarica.com, a huge event that is being put on by. Uh, Another YouTube phenomenon, astrologer, uh, Kaipacha, who is just brilliant. And so it has been just in the last few weeks, couple of months that I've gotten to know her, but I actually knew of her well before uh, this particular event and well before this particular year. Uh, I know that Sol is well respected in the astrology world, well loved in the astrology world. Uh, she was at the recent Norwalk conference last year that I was speaking at, and I just saw how much uh, love and respect that people had for her. So I had it in the back of my mind, like, okay, I want to get to know this person at some point. And so I'm really, really grateful that it came together as it has. Now, Soul has been an astrologer for a long time, over 20 years, and her work is primarily with evolutionary astrology and healing work. She does so much. She's lectured all over the world and she does uh, soul flow therapy, meditation instructor, instructor. I'm reading off a list here because it's a long list here. Certified energy healer and yoga geek and mother of two teenagers, which is huge. See, that's the thing. And she's got three cats as well, which is also a big deal. Um, but welcome. Welcome, soul. Thank you for being here. You know, it's so nice. It's like coming slightly to to mexico and i'm here in in norway where we had like a very dark winter and uh, uh i get a little bit of your sunlight yeah. into my living room now it feels great actually yeah. and very yeah. soon we are going to be in the sun together in costa rica yeah That's my really skin cool. will yeah my skin will probably get a little shocked I yeah thought. yeah but i think that there's ways to address that for those people who have sensitive skin um, lots and lots of uh, sunscreen. Keep the sunscreen <laughs> flowing. Keep stay in the shade, but also enjoy. You know, like the sun is so healing. That's the thing. See, I'm from Canada, so I understand what it is to be in a climate where there's little sun and it's cold. Uh, and I know how powerful it was when I first came here uh, to feel that sense of of just the sun being a force of healing in the, in the world, certainly, but to us as well. And so you're gonna experience that really soon in Costa Rica. No, I can't wait, it's, I really can't wait. It's, it's been very, very dark here. And when you live, a, I live a, around 53 degrees north, and it's, you know, it's pretty far up north compared to a lot of other um, parts of the world where people mostly live. Mm -hmm. And they, you get a very specific, um, you get in touch with seasons for sure. You know, it, it's very dark in the winter and then it gets really light in the summer. But at the um, equinoxes, you get this kind of tingly feeling. It's either the spring that comes in, like right now, we can sense it. It's pretty exciting. It's like <gasps> every day there's a little bit more light. And then in the fall, it becomes like a death process, very in tune with the astrological signs then we are sort of moving into a more inward uh, approach and, and it feels like, okay, we're going into darkness again. So it makes a lot of sense for me to work as an astrologer up here because of the seasons and the light in general, you know, how it shifts and how the whole cycle is, is a, pro, a process. So that's, that's, very that's good. Powerful. Yeah, it that's is. so powerful. And yeah. it makes you so aware of how much, especially in the tropical zodiac, which is um, how planets are observed and calculated, uh, especially in the Western world by Western astrologers, it's so linked to the seasons. So it becomes that much more on the surface for you, I would imagine. Well, it becomes a, a living and breathing process. It's every year it's um, it, it really the knowledge that I have about the zodiac you know I use the tropical zodiac um, it, it deepens and evolutionary astrology is like that it, it sees the whole cycle as a process it begins with the first seed in Aries and then culminates in Pisces where we are right now so so how would you describe evolutionary astrology oh <laughs> well they 
it is the reason why I fell in love with it was actually because it had uh, a, a lot of knowledge around the nodal axis. And I came to know the nodal axis very early in my studies. Uh, maybe because I have such a juicy configuration around my own nodal axis, I, I really was curious to find knowledge about it. So I, I, I searched and I found. And that brought me in touch with evolutionary astrology. And for me, it makes sense that astrology is connected in some way to an understanding of what is the soul, uh, that we are souls with personalities, and that we incarnate several times um, well, we incarnate several times. So there's this, for me, that's, that makes sense in a way, although it's still, it's, it's an ongoing study or reflection of what is life anyway, right? But um, because of my interest for healing, for instance, which is as old as my interest for astrology, um, for me, it became a natural expression to study evolutionary astrology because of the knowledge around the soul and because of, in particular, the nodal axis. Mm. And so is yeah. this what you're going to be teaching? You're going to be focusing your lessons on um, at astrologyrisingcostarica.com. <laughs> That's where you're going <laughs> to be teaching about evolutionary astrology as well. What are your lessons going to be centered around? Well, the whole new paradigm astrology group are more or less trained in evolutionary astrology, um, except for, you know, uh, Jules, who is coming from a little bit uh, different approach. Uh, but yeah, so everything is kind of like seen through that filter, but I will be teaching on, uh, on things that are more general, like it can apply to, like uh, it, it is of interest, of, you know, no matter which school of astrology you belong in. And uh, it is Chiron in Aries, for instance, that is very important. I, like, I've been doing loads of studies around Chiron. It was actually my first international lecture was on Chiron. So it's been with me for such a long time. So that's really a true pleasure to um, give a lecture about something that I find uh, so powerful as, as Chiron, as an archetype and as a... Um, and as a reality in our own lives. So this Chiron in Aries is definitely something that I'm looking forward to. And I'm also doing composites because I'm a big fan of composites and synastry and because relationships are so important. So for me, a lot of the work that I've been doing the last couple of years has uh, is, um, it's been a lot about the masculine and the feminine, about men and women, about relationships, um, about inner balance, um, I've also done a lot of work around the asteroids because I, I feel it's very important for the healing of the feminine. And um, and my yoga class will also be this tantra of yoga, this masculine-feminine balance all the time. So that's my focus for this uh, astrology rising. And so that's so interesting. The asteroids speak to the sacred feminine. Is that what you said? Can you talk more about that? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, there is this uh, thing with Ceres. Ceres was discovered in 1801. And she was found at the place where they assumed that there would be a planet. But instead of finding a planet there, they found a whole belt of asteroids. And they, they don't know whether it was a planet that got crushed and just spread all over over or if it was a planet that never managed to quite fully form it's between mars and jupiter this asteroid belt and um the first and the biggest of the asteroids they named ceres ceres is one of the 12 in the olymp so she's very important back in the roman mythology and even further back as demeter in the greek mythology and she is now classified as a dwarf planet along with pluto uh, which coincidentally also um, is part of this very important story about Ceres, Prosophina, and, um, and the abduction of her daughter by Pluto. So I, I, I find it such an odd and beautiful synchronicity that they're both classified as dwarf planets. And um, she carries a lot of the weight of the asteroid, this great mother energy. And I feel that the, the first four, um, the first, 
the ones that we use most in astrology, which is Pallas Athena, Vesta, Juno, and Ceres, are all carrying important messages for us in terms of how to become more conscious of the feminine nature and become more conscious of what is the feminine initiation. What does it mean to be a woman or feminine? You know, you can be a man and have very strong feminine nature as well. Um, and today, you know, um, we also have people who don't define themselves as neither male or female. So um, I like to call it masculine and feminine energy in general. But generally speaking, a lot of women in particular um, need help to, to, to regain a healthy sense of their own femininity. Um, and to find, um, you know, through these asteroids, they find keys and understanding as to how to navigate this inner landscape uh, that is feminine energy. So, yeah, very important. And especially right now, you know, now we have this other planet, Aries, um, that is also part of this um, feminine astrology, you might call it. And this year she squares Pluto, so I think it will be mighty important, actually, um, this release coming from the inside for a lot of people today. Oh, wow, mm. yeah. I mean, I actually also think that a couple of thoughts came to mind while you were sharing. One was around, you know, Carl Jung and how he talks about the anima and the animus. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially, if you're male, you still have that part of you the anima that is sort of the female part of you and vice versa. If you're female, you have that part of your psyche that is also male, but these are ultimately, we're talking about it in terms of as a principle. And even in mythology, we see these like non-binary principles as well. But um, another thing that came to mind while you were sharing was around um, how it is that by owning for example, women being able to be more in ownership of their sacred masculine, it actually is a way of men becoming more empowered as well in that they can own their own sacred feminine as well. Like we aren't in that kind of very strong dichotomy that societies have been in for so long, for thousands of years. We're now moving to this place of sort of um, convergence, if you will, of greater integration within ourselves, but also in our societies as well. And the other thing I thought was about Mars retrograde in Aries is coming up really soon at the end of this year, the second half of this year, pretty much. And mm. that's happening all in Aries. And I do feel like that is going to speak so strongly for so many of us um, with looking at the sacred masculine and what that actually means and toxic masculinity and what that actually means and how to heal that as well. And so yeah. these other aspects you're mentioning, um, it sounds like it's almost like working together. It's further affirming this idea that we are going to be looking at this, the sacred masculine and sacred feminine and how to heal it more deeply. Yeah. I mean, the problem very often is that they don't uh, cooperate on the inner level, you know? Um, so there's instability in, in our energy field. We tend to um, go back and forth uh, between uh, these qualities within us. And I think, you know, um, that is the gift of being able to study these things is that you understand that within yourself, you have a very strong masculine presence as well. And that would, that ensures that boundaries are kept and that there's a, a logic capacity for logic and perspective, and that there's a certain vertical axis, like a very strong, powerful surge up the spine, if you like, whereas the, um, feminine energies are more into connection. I want to connect with people. I want to feel them. I want to feel what I'm eating. I want to taste everything. It's more sensual in a way, but it's all into connection and love actually. And it's more horizontal. And one without the other is a tragedy actually, because the feminine without the masculine, you know, tends to go from one connection to the other without uh, being aware, without, you know, and then getting, um, as Persephone as well, you know, getting sucked into the underworld and, you know, <laughs> getting involved with the wrong people and, yeah. you know, you know, like not being able to use that logical vertical spine energy. And, you know, and then we have this issue with uh, where there's no respect 
for you know for the feminine because it's it's kind of giving it a, itself away too too soon you know so i think today we have a lot of frustration around these things and a lot of misconception around it as well there's a lot of defensiveness when we talk about these things especially because there seems to be like a anger between the sexes you know like there's this like because we criticize each other so much you know it's your fault it's your fault so you know my 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 inspiration in my work is to 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 mend that gap and i'm very inspired by the story of shiva and shakti and how when they get together as one functioning unit the demons cannot arise on earth because so the prince of story. love yeah tell us yeah that that, that's a great story okay so shiva and shakti are out having a nice time and they get into a um, a little misunderstanding. Mercury must have been retrograde or something. <laughs> <laughs> and she gets insulted. You know, she's like, it's like, you know, like, you know, sometimes you have this, does this dress look good on me? Uh, yeah, it looks great. What? You thought I gained weight? You know, that kind of misunderstanding. So she goes and throws herself in the fire and dies. And Jiva, Shiva uh, withdraws into his own meditation on the mountain. So he refuses to participate in the world. Which is sometimes what we see when the masculine is not connected with the feminine, is that it's too detached. It's not connecting, it's, it's distant, it's, it's just wanting to withdraw from the world. And he's just in mourning, he doesn't want to live because he lost his consort, he lost his only, you know, his other half. And what happens is that the demon starts to, to wreak havoc on earth. Everything is just chaos without this principle because they are so fundamental it's the yin and the yang and the other gods are, are getting frustrated because they see this destruction and they say we have to reincarnate uh, shakti so they do they reincarnate her as parvati you probably heard about this and um, she she's into a, a, a very normal family and the family is getting a little bit of uh, thinking she's a bit of a problem because all she wants to do is is, you know, worship Shiva. She's like, this, you know, he's, he's a dirty, poor God sitting on a mountain. Nobody, you know, he's not like these other, you know, gods. So the parents are like, what, you know, we can't marry this, uh, this girl. She just wants to, to serve Shiva. So they send her off to serve Shiva. And uh, she brings him tea and everything, you know, just serving, serving. And, but he does not recognize her. He's there still with his eyes closed. He doesn't open his third eye, which is the capacity of Shiva. And so they bring in an equivalent of Cupid and just to sort of seduce him. And that does not work according to plan because for a little moment there, he falls in love with her and it's like, oh my God. And then he snaps out of it and he realizes that he's been fooled. And you shall not fool Shiva. You know, like this is a, the, to its clarity beyond our capacity as humans. And so he realizes this and he kills off that God and he, he, he sends Parvati away because he thinks that she's in on it. And she sits on another mountain and she starts her own practice. You know, she's still in deep meditation. She's still in deep meditation. They sit on each their mountain in deep meditation. And then there's this realization that happens through certain things that happens in the story, like she renounces certain um, other men. And then one of these is, is Shiva. And then she recognizes herself as Shakti, and he recognizes her as Shakti when she recognizes herself as Shakti. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is amazing. This is like the goddess is finally realizing herself. And then she will be realized by him as well. You know, there's something very subtle in that story about love and how when we get to that point where we realize who we are, then it's possible for others to realize who we are as well. And then there's uni unity again between the, the yin and the yang, the plus and the minus, and peace. Isn't this that beautiful? Right. Yeah, because before she had that recognition, it was like they weren't connecting, even though she was sort of, I guess you could say unconsciously driven towards him and motivated. She just knew that she wanted to be with him or in his presence or in some way, as you said, mm. serve him. Mm. But there wasn't that conscious recognition on her part as to why or what's really going on, what's the deeper 
drive here. And so she wasn't recognizing her own sacred. And therefore, it was like the world and him were responding to that lack of recognition. It's so amazing because I think, you know, that's again something you see in the story of Ceres and Josefina is that the initiation into womanhood has to do with recognizing who you are. You know, we are so outwardly, you know, defined and conditioned sometimes. And, you know, it, it's not until that moment, until the girl recognizes the, that she's a woman, that her beauty really starts to, and her power, not just, I mean, I, it's a little sad to call it beauty, but it is beauty, it's this inner love that just starts to arise in anyone who get in touch with that part in themselves. And that has such a, a power of attraction, you know, it, it's really very opposite of the masculine drive. You know, I see a goal, I, I reach the goal, I use my willpower to get there. The feminine energy is more like I'm here, I sit in my energy, I am my energy, and everything comes to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's the power of attraction, you know. So, and then you have the masculine principle within each woman and for those who are very feminine in their energy, that protects that because you don't want to attract everything. You, you want to have a certain kind of like, yes, no, yes, no. Like, this is good for me. That's just, oh, I think you will probably not be respectful in my house. And so therefore you can go. <laughs> right. I often think of like, for example, in our Western astrology paradigm, Venus as a feminine principle and Mars as a masculine principle, if we take that as an example. And Mars is that circle of completion, right? You have the circle and then an arrow arising from it. So it's like action arising from a place of self-knowledge. But as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking about how the sacred masculine, it's almost like, it's also a protection. Hmm. It's like the way you see, you know, when people do rituals, they'll have a circle drawn around them as a way of protecting the energetic space. Um, and so in a way, it's like the masculine principle, which Mars represents, is a way to protect that, that sacred space. But you're so right. I have seen it in, in uh, people where, where it is that you are not understanding the sacredness of that, of that space. I mean, it's just, you're just flowing, right? You're just flowing without any intention or you're just absorbing, absorbing without any protection. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's not a, it's ultimately the balance of the active principle and the receptive principle, understanding when it's wise and what you need to protect that in order to use it as a gift. It's that balance ultimately that empowers us most. Yeah, and I also heard stories about how they used to have like uh, rituals around Vesta, Vesta, which is the hearth, you know, the fire inside the house that is protective in itself. She's a fire goddess. And they also had like a, a, a um, the, you know, a, a hermish or a, mercur a mercurial principle outside. They kept that mm -hmm. outside the house and then the Vesta energy inside the house. So there again comes the yin and the yang. And for me, that's so important because um, because of the splits that I see. Separation is so easy in, in our world today. It's so easy to, to separate from everything. Whereas I think, you know, deep inside our hearts and in our souls is in particular, we want to cooperate. We want to make things work. It, the principle of love wants that, right? So so it's it's taking, you know, this, insane competitiveness and and you know this um sense of not being given what you're supposed to be given on earth that leads to this um injustice um to bringing these things up to a higher level when you have a very strong functioning masculine feminine principle within yourself you are you are indeed independent right but you're still capable of relating mm -hmm. you know? then, right. and that's a, like living more fully Mm. Yeah, I think that there's also, I've actually thought a lot about how, you know, when we think about, for example, air energy, like for example, mercury, mercury has so often been conceptualized as an androgynous god, right? Mm. For example, we see this in ancient Greece in particular, and we see that one of his children was uh, the first, uh, I think it was hermaphroditus. So essentially, just as it sounds, it was a uh, he gave birth to ultimately a, a principle that was two-spirited, that had both male and female within one being. And I think about how 
mm. cultures that are very cerebral, right? Like a, a Canada, for example. These are also cultures where there's a lot of emphasis placed on equality. There's mm. a lot of uh, emphasis placed on this idea that your own uh, ideas and your thoughts and your mind and education, these are the equalizing factors. But then what happens in that is if the energy becomes too cerebral, becomes a little bit too lifted. And that was a part of the revelation when I first came here to Mexico, mm -hmm. was that there's a different way to live. There's a way to honor all of it, not just the masculine principle mm -hmm. of action, not just the cerebral principle of, of mind and detachment, but then there's also this sense of having a body, you know, understanding that the body has wisdom and, and knowledge and desires and motivations. And sometimes they work well together and sometimes they don't. And that's okay. Like mm. there's this, this embodied wisdom, if you will, that I think sometimes in cultures like Canada, like Europe, certainly much of Europe, where you see it becomes almost disembodied because of the emphasis on either the masculine action principle or the, um, the, the cerebral androgynous principle, if you will. Mm. It's a loss for society, actually. I think, you know, it's gone so far that, you know, and that, uh, um, that a lot of people are not capable of listening in even, you know, it's, it's this, uh, you know, my yoga practice, that spans over, you know, like almost two decades now, has is a continuous experience of being able to listen in. What is it that I need today? What is it that my body is craving today? You know, what is it that I need to 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 be with? And it's it's not neglectful. It's it's the opposite. But I think yeah, our hectic schedules and everything, it just like and our ambitions and our need for survival and whatnot is just. Uh, confusing that capacity and you know with the asteroids it becomes very clear you have to live your life with intention and you have to and there's a there's a merging of spirit with matter and that conflict is pretty you know if you go back in in history and, and looking at the religious part of it you know we were pretty much you know uh, <laughs> decapitated you know we, we like this sexual nature for instance became a little bit of a sinful thing you know instead of you know instead of being uh tuned in with your sensual self it became something that you should hide you know like um uh you know put you know really suppress in a way and if you just breathe like we should we should breathe more organically you know like most people have very shallow breathing it's like from the top of their lungs and you know uh, but then there will be noises coming from you and those noises are pretty sensual you know it's like ah, you show yourself in a way it's not hiding it's, it's expressing the true nature your feelings for instance you know like being vulnerable again and that is so healing for so much of what we see today with with a lot of imbalance a lot of um uh, hyperactivity, a lot of uh, fatigue syndrome, a lot of eating disorders, a lot of sleep trouble, people uh, are having strange rhythms. So feminine energy is bringing you into the rhythm again of the organic living, you know, being organic. And then you have to be brave and say, listen, today I need to rest. So I'm going to just cross off everything on my to-do list and I'm going to lay here shamelessly breathing and just enjoying myself knowing that if I just get to fill up my batteries for a little while, I'll be replenished and then I'll be able to do my work. Is what we say in yoga. You can't make juice of a dried lemon. Mm -hmm. Wow. So let me ask you, let me take it back to the beginning. I don't think I asked you this because I always like to ask this, like, how did you first not only get into astrology, but even if we go before then, even though I want to know how you got into astrology in the early days, but even before then, like, when do you remember resonating with astrology? Like, what was that? Like, for me, that moment was, I remember being a little girl looking up at the sky and just feeling it in my heart. I just oh, yeah. felt it. And to me, that was, you know, the, the awakening of, hey, you know, this is, this is the path maybe. Now, reflecting back, of course, at the time, I didn't know. So what was that like for you? What do you remember in your earliest connection with the sky well 
I had the great privilege of growing up with a father who was into astrology. And when I was three years old, they had these classes in my house with astrology. And he had a very good friend that I later got to meet. And he told me when I was a kid, I ran around there, you know, while they were doing their astrology. I grew up with this little folder filled with hand-drawn uh, charts. My father made them for the whole family. So I saw my charts very, very early. And when I ran into some issues with myself, I was a, a teen, I'm Aquarius, you know, I grew up in a place and uh, where, you know, this group consciousness is very strong. And it became evident very early that I didn't quite identify with it. So I started seeking my own things. And I had a huge uh, crisis at that time. When I was 12, 13, 14, I just withdrew. And astrology gave me a lot of the answers. And that's when I started questioning my father. I'm like, eh, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And he, he gave me the basic principle and very good ones as well. You know, like he taught me the basic. You just have to just look at the planets, you know, from a, a, from a physical point of view. Like, for instance, Jupiter, you know, Jupiter is, the, you know, the biggest planet in the solar system. And it gives off 12 times as much energy as it receives from the sun. So it's basically a little sun. And that's how it operates in the chart as well, you know, like, and so on and so forth. Oh, that's so cool. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so now I know why I'm like this. Okay, great. So because I have my moon there and my Mars there and it gave me very, like a, a much needed psychological insight. And then I had a dream, you know, when I was, I don't know how old I was. I was dreaming. I was walking in a forest and I had this really long hair and I had a book under my arm and I had a wand in my hand. And the only thing I remember from the dream was the realization that I'm an astrologer. Mm. So dreaming has been a lot of my work as well, dream work for, for like since I was a child. So for me, it was just very natural. Everything else, I mean, I haven't even tried. I didn't even try. It was just following gravity. Mm, exactly. There's like this soul level pull in that direction. That's what happens. Yeah, I just, it was an open door. I tried not to go into it actually many times because I'm socially aware. I know what people think about astrology, you know, and it's been hurtful many times because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fairly, I, I used to be more vain, but I was fairly vain when it came to my intellect because I did well in school and whatnot. So everybody had these expectations of becoming a doctor or whatnot, you know, like, and I was always very good at uh, talking. So, so having that as a, an image, you know, like, you know, and, and then having to meet people who cannot really understand astrology or tend to judge it before they get their noses into it has been a psychological development that is now finally kind of, you know, I'm done with explaining. I'm just here doing it exactly. now. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're comfortable with what you do, it's like, whatever, it doesn't even matter. But I do think to be an astrologer, I agree with you completely. It is to kind of be okay with being a little on the outside. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. You're willing to really be out there from the mainstream, if you will, to, to be an astrologer. And right now with Neptune and Pisces, more people are embracing astrology, certainly mm -hmm. their horoscopes more, their bigger audiences, which is, you know, really nice. And hopefully more people, especially if you think about with astrology conferences, because you and I both go to astrology conferences, um, they've gotten bigger and they continue yeah. to get bigger, which is wonderful. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that trend continues or not once uh, mm -hmm. Neptune changes signs and moves into Aries. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. Because Neptune it, coming up in the next few years, um, Pluto's moving into Aquarius. Mm. In weeks from now, from the time we're recording this, Saturn's moving into Aquarius and that tends to be a constricting kind of a principle. But then Pluto moves into Aquarius and Neptune moves into um, Aries. Aries. So it'll be interesting to see how um, how astrology evolves and grows or adapts because astrology, I think, is a living practice. It, it responds mm. to whatever uh, social time and social climate it finds. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just the discovery of the different planets reflects that, mm -hmm. you know, like right now we've had since 77 Chiron, for instance, which is also heralding a time of more natural uh, therapies and whatnot. And this whole paradigm of, of understanding the, that we are wounded in a way through our historical genetics and, and just this whole mythology around Chiron has also been reflected through society. Now, I'm, I'm not worried that uh, astrology, uh, you know, uh, will change, but like, it, like the interest will diminish, but it will certainly be challenges with it being such a media thing right now. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, I hopefully, you know, that's why we're doing this MPA school and for instance OPA is doing a lot of this peer work and there's a great emphasis on actually you know if you want to work with people and the word of an astrologer, astrologer matters you know so you have to be well trained to consult and deal with people when they come to you in, in very challenging times in their lives for instance or with difficult problems that's why I, I started healing and that's why I, I did psychotherapy training and that's why I did all these other modalities so that I felt really sure that when I met people I knew what I was doing right and oh, yes. uh, because and up until very recently in human history astrologers were the intermediaries of the gods like that has mm -hmm. been our role yeah. Since, you know, forever, really, since the dawn of Yeah, yeah never been priest. Yeah, some of the earliest uh, documents that exist, some of the earliest cave drawings are of people drawing celestial phenomenon, mm. making sense of it in relation to events on earth. And so mm. these were spiritual people, these were the priests, these were the shamans, the spiritual leaders. And I do think that on a collective unconscious level, we still kind of see the astrologer almost viscerally, right? Automatically. Like when you go to have a reading and I had this experience not too long ago, someone who didn't know I was an astrologer and I had a, a quick reading and I had that feeling, you know, that people get when they first go to an astrologer, like, or, or they go to a consult like, where your stomach kind of flips a little bit. And that <laughs> flip is because mm. part of you is like, tell me something good, tell me something good. But the reading <laughs> <laughs> because on an unconscious level, we still see the astrologer as the intermediary mm. of the gods. And that comes with a lot of responsibility, a whole lot of responsibility. And, you know, I recently have been meditating on this a lot about the idea that, you know, we are standing on such incredible shoulders, like Plato, mm. like uh, Alan Leo, like mm. Ibn Arabi, right? We are truly carrying forward this tradition of wisdom and contemplation. And that, that is something that should be approached with a, a certain ethic. But then that's us, right? Like that's how we feel. Not everybody uh, feels that way. And astrology isn't that for everybody. And that's the thing. And I think one of the things people like about astrology or that encourages them to become astrologers is that it is kind of a wild west. It really mm -hmm. can be whatever you want, right? <laughs> <laughs> and anything goes you know like and that's 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 the thing you know it's, it's kind of like somewhere in the, like because it's it, you know like if you can just take a look at these two signs you were mentioning like uh, capricorn and aquarius and capricorn it represents you know the established you know it, for me it's it's the it's the um, it's the well uh, tried out you know the 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 things that proven to work you know so we want to have some quality and in Capricorn, we demand that this is like with integrity. And it is actually, if you look at it esoterically, the path of initiation. So with every a mystery tradition, like for shamanism, for instance, it is a path of initiation. You just can't go to a school and say, yeah, I got my diploma. No, you have to go through the thing people have to go through in order to become shamans, which is mm. like facing death and stuff like that you know all mm -hmm. oh, right you're so right yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 it's not it's not like yeah it's just this really cozy class no it's not cozy at all it's like hardcore really in your face like are you ready to die and uh, this is the path of initiation that comes in capricorn but the, the beautiful thing with astrology that i keep i'm falling in love with over and over again is that particular 
seeing the position that it has in society today. It's, it's a little bit on the outside. So it doesn't really have to adhere to the laws and regulations that are too narrow. You know, it can get too narrow minded inside that Capricornian bubble thing where it's like, oh yeah, but you haven't gotten, you know, the credentials and you're missing out a point there. And it's like, everybody's welcome. And so much welcome because it relies on the intuitions of the inspired people on this earth. Everybody can do great research in astrology. Everybody, a student can do excellent research in astrology and find fabulous stuff. And it's because it's still developing and it needs to continue to develop. It will continue to develop like me and the asteroids, you know, not all astrologers, you know, think that's something to use and some the traditional astrologers they go to Saturn and that's it and they use the traditional rulers and whatnot and you know astrology is 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 um it's kind of like what we chose to call the conference actually the astrology rising um uh, unity in diversity mm -hmm. and that's so Aquarian in a way so yes. I'm I'm really looking forward to Pluto into Aquarius because it's heralding the time of you know the age of Aquarius. Although we're not yet there, but we're still in what I call the twilight zone between the ages. So we're letting go of something old, but we're not quite sure what the new is. And I think you know what that means is that everybody is welcome, and we need your contribution. You know, we want you to be a co-creator on this planet. That's how everybody can feel that they are here for a reason and then they will take responsibility from not from duty it comes from love mm -hmm. and it's such a beautiful thing you know so as you can see i'm very excited about this particular transit of course you know yeah, looking too. back historically we've seen great changes with this particular transit and yeah. I, mean, I know you appreciate this you're an evolutionary astrologer i've been very influenced by evolutionary astrology but i consider myself more of a spiritually inclined astrologer that's how i like to describe myself and so i completely love that there are so many of us who care about in some way using astrology to put something good into the world right using mm. astrology to affirm higher principles that i really do believe i like to call it love and wisdom i was very mm. influenced by the the Sufi mystic and astrologer Ibn mm. Arabi. And it really is like his understanding of astrology that colors my work very strongly. But there are astrologers who maybe are not necessarily aware or inclined towards evolution or spiritual growth or awareness. And astrology just is, right? I like to say mm. you can't have astrology without the astrologer we are ultimately bringing interpretation to the sky. It's an act of poetry in a sense that we bring mm -hmm. and there's enough room for everybody, whatever you're into. But I do think if people were inclined to watch this particular uh, talk with you and I, well, chances are they're more on the, the spiritual inclination side. Yeah, I loved what you said, you know, like how we normally had a position earlier on as, you know, counselor to the kings or like, like, the high priestesses or high priests i think it is a, a beautiful thing to talk with the gods you know i i call it talking with the gods let's see what the gods say you know like i have a nice little chat with jupiter and like i, I can really feel these energies you know it's just the my my book that's coming out in a few weeks prayers to the sky it's exactly about this it's exactly mm. about understanding these sacred energy energies these mythological energies and how they live through you and talking mm -hmm. to them like actually what what is a prayer it's a communication it's having a conversation uh and it's exactly about this and i totally agree and we do this as astrologers especially those of us who are spiritually inclined is that we think of these as sacred energies that we're wanting to tap into there is like something a very good exercise if people want to train up this ability. My father taught me the first one, which is simply meditating on the planet, you know. Um, but this other one that is very fun to work with is just try to see when you walk, wherever you walk, you know, what type of energy is that? What type of energy is that? You know, is this Mars? Is this Venus? Is this the moon? Or oh, there's like a Neptunian thing over there, you know, like <laughs> yeah. because they're everywhere. And, you know, we're just, 
cosmic weather reporters in a way. Today the That's weather is fun. very mercurial. Today, <laughs> like Mercury and Pisces. We have Mercury and Pisces retrograde right now. Which right is, now, yeah. Uh, Let's hope powerful. this interview turns out okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, about this Mercury and Pisces, yeah. The thing is that, um, well, it's it's the regular chaos thing, you know, like, you, and, and you're being pulled into several dimensions at the same time. And, and especially Mercury and Pisces is such a, you know, retrograde you know there's one sign that's particularly interesting when mercury goes retrograde and it's pisces because yeah. it's all it's already retrograde in a way when it goes into pisces. I know, right that's what i've been saying yeah it's already like ah. <laughs> it's a double whammy man yeah, it can yeah. be part of the fun i know but yeah right about now when like requests and things come in i'm like oh mercury retrograde in pisces ah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's one thing though i learned with that like the one of the things that really happened to me was and that turned out to be super instrumental in the way that I treat astrology is that I had this uh, plane ride. I was meeting Maurice Fernandez and a group in South Africa, and I was had just given birth, so I was full of hormones. It was like one and a half year after I gave birth to my daughter, and I'm heading. I'm thinking I'm very selfish. I go for this, you know, excursion in South Africa to study astrology. Yeah, and I felt really guilty about it. So I was checking the stars and I got really, you know, frightened. I scared myself and I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And then I got on board on the plane and I had really like the most intense experience. I thought there was a bomber on the plane and this guy who sat next to me was this guy, you know, because he, um, all my judgment came up, you know, it wasn't long after 9-11 and I was not, like I was going into crazy, you know, like this kind of thing. And then I, you know, as he was doing his prayers and I was, and you know, like I was freaking out majorly next to him. I'm like, I, I, I was semi aware of myself. This is ridiculous, tool, but I could not contain myself. It was like everything flushed up. I, it was probably my guilt. So I, I lean over to him carefully and I say, excuse me, sir, are you okay? And then he looked at me with the most beautiful, compassionate eyes and he said, thank you for caring. And at that moment, I felt so stupid. I'm like, here I am with my judgments and whatnot. And I just, you know, like, I like, I felt so embarrassed. And we had a beautiful talk about God and astrology. And he said, what do you do? And I say, I'm an astrologer. Ah, oh, we don't use that in, in, in Islam, he says. And I said, why? No, we want to trust God every day. <laughs> Well, actually, it was Muslim astrologers who sort of allowed, who put astrology I know. in a monotheistic yeah. context, who were the very beginning of psychological astrology. So it's always interesting, you know, how people, exactly, they bring themselves, right? And so that was his uh, interpretation. But what I loved about that story that you just told was that it is such a powerful thing to be willing to even acknowledge that some part of your own shadow is playing out here. No, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and it, that arise from shadow. And it taught me that I cannot be afraid of astrology. I cannot be afraid of life. I cannot use astrology as a tool to control the future. Mm -hmm. I still have to find that little piece of trust that you know it will all work out because I'm in alignment with a higher spiritual principle in my daily life. I always reach for the gods in a way mm -hmm. so yeah then you can have mercury retrograde and you can have neptune going here and there and you can have i don't know whatever and it will still be fine you know yeah. that's the kind it, of thing it was ibn arabi who said that the sky is perfect the chart mm -hmm. is perfect and mm. that when we practice astrology ultimately it is to glimpse the mystery it is to glimpse mm. how it is that we are the breath of God, as he described it, that we so are beautiful. how it is that God gets to experience itself in ways that it would not have had we not been there to have that exact emotion, that exact experience. And in this way, we are the embodiment of God, the expansion of the lungs of God. And that's what astrology helps us to appreciate. It is that glimpse into it. And so when you have that understanding, there's very little space for fear left. In fact, fear gets in the way mm, of us yeah. embracing that, that breath of the divine that we are. Oh, that pure knowledge. You know, of course, we have to work on ourselves. We have to 
clean our karma in a way. You have to mm -hmm. heal whatever it is. We have to become conscious. And, but this is exactly, which is funny, we got into this subject because it's actually one of the lectures I'm also giving at astrologywriting.com. Awesome. <laughs> it's about Neptune, Neptune in Pisces and how that can uh, get us in touch with something on a very deep level that has to do with this particular truth. Mm. However, relative truth can be, you know, uh, because truth is relative to where you are in your life. Many truths, but, absolutely. Yeah. But I think, you know, uh, we are, which is my favorite picture image, we are sailing on this rock on, you know, that is circling around a huge fireball. And we are together with 200 billion other fireballs in this galaxy alone. Mm -hmm. And this galaxy is in company with so much other galaxies. And we don't know where we are. But we are here, and it's a miracle, and it's scary too, you know, it's really scary. So astrology done well is helping us navigate. Mm -hmm. And to also own our own ball that we are, you know, yeah. own our own, the galaxy that we are, and our interconnection to the larger galaxy and the, the mm. multiverses that we're in. I like to say we're <laughs> in first in a multiverse, you know? So yeah, there will be some cosmic dancing when we get to Costa Rica, I'm sure. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun together. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. so much, Soul. I loved yeah. getting to know you. I loved talking to you. It was such a, a pleasure. And I just, I just think it's going to be an amazing event. I think we're all going to learn so much from each other. We're all going to have a lot of fun, that's for sure. I know <laughs> that we have basically the whole resort to ourselves in Costa Rica. So all these spiritually minded and uh, like-minded and astrology-minded people. As you said, almost everybody just about is an evolutionary astrologer or like myself, inspired by evolutionary astrology. So we're bringing that uh, spiritual awareness and perspective. And I think it'll be like spiritually fulfilling, but also uh, fun. <laughs> There'll be parties on the beach and all kinds of things. So I think it'll be wonderful to spend time with you and yeah, yeah, yeah. expecting about 200 people. Mm. Oh, it'll be a big, beautiful event. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. It was such. It was so nice last time too. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of beaches, and the the resort is straight on the beach, and you get in touch with nature so well there. You know, we had all kinds of experiences with nature while we were there. You know, there was these thunderstorms, and you know, there was just you know, like a, a real connection with nature, and that is so healing. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. I just love it. <laughs> I love it too. And mm. thank you. Thank you for this time that we shared. I appreciate it so much. So yeah, thank you, Nadia. And thank you so much for being here, for being a part of Synchronicity Web TV. And until we connect again, take care.